My name is Samson Itodo. As Twenty-one. Early release of election funds to IMEC. Clause three. The bill strengthens the financial independence of the Independent National Electoral Commission, IMEC, by ensuring that all funding required for a general election is released not later than one year before the next general elections. Inclusion of persons with disability. Clause 54. The Commission shall take reasonable steps to ensure that persons with disabilities, special needs, and vulnerable persons are assisted at the polling place by the provision of suitable means of communication. Legalizing electronic accreditation of voters, clause 47. The bill makes provision for electronic accreditation of voters using smart card readers or any technological device as may be determined by INEC. Redefined overvoting, clause 51. Redefined overvoting, clause 51. According to the bill, overvoting occurs when the number of votes cast at an election in any polling unit exceed the total number of accredited voters in that polling unit. With this new provision, total number of accredited voters will become a determining factor in the validity of votes in an election. The outdated definition had been exploited by politicians to manipulate electoral outcomes. Substitution of candidates in the event of death in an election Clause 34. The new bill addresses a lacuna in the current electoral law, which was manifest in the 2015 governorship election in Kogi State, where a candidate died before the result of that election was announced. The bill affords political parties the opportunity to conduct primary elections to replace a candidate who dies at the sequence of polls and before, and before the, the announcement, announcement of fi final results and declaration of a winner. Power to review election results declared under duress. The bill confers INEC with the power to review declarations and returns made under questionable circumstances to keep returning officers in check and ensure full compliance with electoral guidelines. The provision will fundamentally transform the resort management process and deter politicians from compelling polling officials to declare fabricated election results. Early conduct of party primaries and submission of list of candidates Clause 29. Every political party shall not later than 180 days before the date appointed for general elections submit the list of candidates the party proposes to sponsor at the election to the commission, who must have emerged from valid primaries conducted by the political party. Early commencement of campaigns. Clause 94. The period of public campaigns by political parties has been extended from 90 days to 150 days before polling day and end 24 hours prior to that day. Political neutrality of INEC personnel upon appointment and penalty for contravention. Clause 8. A person who, being a member of a political party, misrepresents himself by not disclosing his membership, affiliation, or connection to any political party in order to secure an appointment with a commission in any capacity, commits an offense, and is liable on conviction to a fine of 5 million naira, or imprisonment for a term not exceeding two years, or both. Electronic Transmission of Results, Clause 50. The bill confers INEC with the powers to determine whether election results are transmitted electronically or manually. All right, then. It does look like we've set the stage for us to commence this conversation. You've uh, gotten uh, some kind of sense of what we're going to be talking about. You already were talking about it since last year. We're in a new year now, but... There's a few things about this bill that you're not talking about tonight. Let's get started. Thank you so much, uh, gent uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming. Before I unveil the first panelist, uh, a set of panelists on the program, let me allow you to give us what is on the minds of Nigerians. I wanted us to have this short conversation before I bring on the panelists. First and foremost, what do you think is most critical that people are not talking about? aside the issue of the direct primaries, because I know that will generate a lot of conversations tonight. Okay. One very critical aspect of the Electoral Bill 2021 is that unlike what we used to have, if, the law, if it's passed into law, there will be need for a list of candidates to be sent to INEC 
180 days before the election. What do we have means, before now? Uh, before now, it's um, about 90 days to the election time. But if it's 180 days by this new electoral bill, it means that by August of this year, July, August, the list you get to INEC. And that means that if it's not already signed into law now, that means we have limited time. And most importantly also, campaigns used to start 90 days before election in the current electoral heart. But with this electoral bill 2021, it's going to start 150 days before the general election. There are lots, lots within the electoral bill 2021 that we need to internalize. And generally, delaying the passage of electoral bill you know, it's not good for Nigeria's democracy. Right. Nigeria's democracy is critical to Africa and to the world. And we must all work hard to ensure that we do the needful and in time. Thank you. Are we making a mole out of all of this? Uh, because someone will ask, if this is not passed, is anything wrong with our elections? In the process of, I mean, the way and manner we conduct our elections, Cynthia? Well, I think it's important we know that we can't keep doing the same thing, the same way, and expect a different outcome. And the idea for these electoral reform processes is to give us a new law that captures um, provisions that would ensure our processes are more credible and, and that there is electoral integrity in Nigeria. And I think what is important is the fact that we've reduced this conversation to just issues around direct and indirect primaries. But there's a lot more. So if you think about early funding for elections, um, this current proposed bill provides for funding for elections to go to the Electoral Commission at least a year to the election. Now, why is that important? If you think about our conduct of elections, previous elections, logistics, management, in fact, the postponement of elections that we had in 2019, 2015, even 2011, were attributed to issues around of elections, operations, and logistics, and management. So when INEC receives the funds early, it gives INEC better time to plan. In 2019 elections, and the funds for elections were released barely by January of the, of, the, of the year of the elections, barely weeks to the elections. Now, how would we expect INEC to, um, to conduct elections? So, um, this proposed bill provides for the funds for elections to go to, the, to INEC early. I mean, Another important uh, conversation, Shane, when I think we need to talk about is the fact that this proposal gives INEC the power to review elections results. If it is declared under duress or in, or in breach of the electoral laws and legal framework, imagine what happened in the previous elections when a returning officer said, I'm declaring elect this result under duress, but these results were upheld by court. It would also leave, reduce the way cases go to court because what would happen when returning officers either flout the laws or are forced to declare results, INEC would have a timeline to review these results and ensure that it is, re it is announced in line with the Electoral Act. And, and I think that is what is important, that is beyond direct and indirect primaries. There are other important provisions that this Electoral Bill proposes. So if the bill is not passed and we conduct the next election in this same manner, what is your biggest fear? Two major fears for me. First, citizens who don't have confidence in the process. Why? A lot of citizens, especially young Nigerians, have made a demand for a new law. If it doesn't pass, it passes the wrong message to Nigerians that our government, the president and national assembly, do not care about the electoral process. So it would affect confidence in the process. The second, it would have a direct impact on the quality of elections because we have innovations that would promote credibility of the process and inspire confidence in the process and ensure that the electoral fraud and our practices are reduced. So right. those are two important points. For Great. Me. I'm coming to uh, yourself and Ms. Fijabi just in a moment. Uh, Mr. Jake, you are one person that has fought and spoken up about the rights of uh, people living with disability. Um, are those care taken care of, or are those concerns taken care of in this uh, the, the new bill that is not yet passed? Thank you, Chairman. Well, let me start with a personal story. Uh, I never voted until I was 58, and today I'm 61. So you see, for 58 years, I've been disenfranchised. And that's because the provision in the previous Electoral Act says to INEC, INEC may reasonably accommodate us. This is one bill that have further given impetus to our agitation, which says INEC shall. It means a lot. 
I'm not a lawyer, but I know that it has legal implication. And that is why for us, getting this bill signed will give further hope to the likes of my colleagues who are here, David Aniele, Grace, um, my friend Lloyds, and several others, Chris, many of them have left whatever they are doing and they are here in the hall to say to the president of our country that you have the only opportunity to write your name on a goal. This is one bill that will serve the need of persons with the disability community and give us hope that we too can participate in the electoral process. But not only that, that we too can be elected one day. I live and my dream is to see a person with disability become the president of this country, the vice president of this country, the senator, the governor, the house of rep. Who says we can? It's only opportunities like this and, and processes like this can say that we cannot. But we stand tonight to say we can and we will. The nation apologizes to to you and your friends for uh, the inability to uh, to vote in our election. Shame it's pathetic. Take the apology, but we want action. It will happen. It will happen. And that's the reason why we are here tonight. I'll, I'll get your final take because what we are doing is we're warming the environment. The room is getting warm, and it's going to get to a point where this place is going to be heated. We have some of the brightest people that we can find in this country in this room tonight, and we're saying one thing, that the electoral bill needs to look, be looked into. For you tonight, what is critical? What do you think should be said tonight? The most critical thing is that that bill should become a law. The only issue of direct and indirect primaries is not the only action in that bill. There are several others. So it should be passed immediately. And one thing is that if laws are not passed and given enough time for internalization, it brings about implementation issues which would, of course, affect the EMB, the Independent National Electoral Commission, in delivering on its mandate. Given electoral law, the legal framework for elections, few days, few months to election, is not an effective thing to do. So we should learn our lessons by taking action now and also guarding against delaying passage of electoral bill in the future. Thank Cynthia, you. you and your friends and colleagues, you've called us into this room today. Is early in the year. Uh, why are you not allowing us to go about our businesses and just focus on our, uh, on our work? And you brought us early in this year. Your, what's your focus? What is your agenda? Well, our agenda is to ensure that our citizens will keep the demand on that we need the electoral bill passed into law now. And why we want it to be passed now is because we're barely, it's almost, the day is almost over. So barely 398 days to the elections. So we are running out of time. We need this bill passed, but beyond that, we also need the National Assembly to work with the executive to clean up the bill. We don't want excuses like we had in 2018. So whatever needs to be done, drafting-wise, should be concluded, and we need this bill transmitted to the president for assent again. And, and at the end of it all, Nigerians are watching, and the idea for this is elections is beyond just the process. It's about the people, and the people are those who determine what democracy ought to be like. And Nigerians are saying we need our electoral process to work for us so that we can take ownership of this process because Nigeria's democracy is for Nigeria and our democracy must work. But it needs the electoral process and we need this law, this bill passed into law. Today we go down in history as one day that uh, Nigerians uh, came together, uh, representative of different tribes, ethnic, um, and every shape and uh, form of professions have come into this room, 16th of January. How, how will it be historical for you, Mr. Mr. Jake? Well, every year and every first month of the year, people come together to make resolutions. Today, we are coming together to make a resolution that, Mr. President, you have an opportunity to prove what you said when you took the oath of office. You said you are the president of the people. This is the time to put action to the words and the promise that you made. Remember, we elected you and we are asking you to do what the people want, not what the political class want. 
Sheng, we have made the resolution today that we are calling on the executive arm and the legislative arm to please make sure that the needful is done and this first time inclusive bill is signed so that my people will indeed find hope in a process like this. This is one opportunity for everyone who is in this hall, who is watching tonight, to say to yourself that the day you were born, you cried. Everyone around you rejoiced. We must live our lives so well that the day we die, we will rejoice and everyone around us will cry. Thank you so much, uh, gentlemen and ladies. You know what? Uh, for those of us who grew up in the village, uh, when there is a village meeting and you gather at the city square or the town square, he's always in a circle like this, and uh, it's a replica of what you find there. Those who lived in the city may not have that kind of experience. It's historical that some of us have gathered in this village meeting, which is representative of the meeting of the <laughs> brightest mind in Nigeria, and tonight we're going to make history, and you'll be happy, I promise you. Uh, we went to the street, and one thing that we are also asking, uh, the average Nigerian, a lot of people will wonder, do they understand what this means about this electoral bill? What do they really know about this? We want to know, and we captured their minds in this Vox Pop. Take I wouldn't seat. want uh, uh, the National Assembly to override the president, because the president has come up with reasons why he didn't agree with the director of primaries, which had been suggested. And uh, the, re the reasons are very, very cogent. So personally, I wouldn't want the, the National Assembly to override because they should think. Uh, if, they, if they think and they work together, it's better for everybody. As young people, I feel we should be given a, a space to also execute or tell people or showcase what we have as leaders. As a person, I take things very easy. Um, his reasons for not signing, I may not know, but I feel if he does that, it will still be a, go a, a goal for Nigerians. How do we expect the National Assembly that is not independent to override the decision of Mr. President? Yeah. Look, don't expect any miracle. They cannot. They can only come and tell us that they're going to override Mr. President, yeah. <laughs> but I can put it to you that they will not override Mr. President. If you have a country whereby the National Assembly are independent, whereby their budget and everything is on its own, they don't go to him to seek for any help, then you expect that to happen. But with this kind of a country in Nigeria, you don't expect that. No, we need more digital input into the electoral process that will bring speed and accuracy and reduce the room for mismanagement and uh, what do we call that other word, mago mago. Shockingly, I agree with the president. He said, allow political parties choose. That's where free will, which is democracy, comes in. That he doesn't think it's right for a country to dictate to political parties. I think I agree with that. That's why we all have different ideologies and ways of doing things, so that we all can decide what suits us. In that light, I agree with the president. We know it will be very, very difficult for the crop of the National Assembly member that we have currently to muster that courage and actually override the president. But if you ask me as an individual, it will do not just APC, but the total, you know, totality of Nigerians, good, let them override the president, not for the purpose of the president PC, but for the country at large. I believe direct primaries is the most appropriate because it gives every candidate an opportunity to, you know, to see whether, yes, you are, you are competent enough to be in this position. I personally will not vote in for indirect because most times it is influenced by the cabals of the political parties. But direct primaries, if you are vibrant enough, you are qualified enough, everyone can now vote for you and say, yes, this is our candidate, this is the person we want to support. So I personally vouch for um, direct primary. All right, thank you so much, everyone. We are getting started. The stage is set for my first set of panelists tonight. Uh, the governor of Nassau State, I mean, others that are going to be discussing uh, our first line of conversation is about the pillars of these electoral bills. Stay with us, everyone. We'll take a break, and when we come back, the conversation will commence effectively.
Good evening, sir. Happy New Year to you, Prof. Yes, sir. How are you, sir? Happy New Year. Yes, sir. How are you? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. You are supposed to, <laughs> to unveil your face. That's right. Thank you so much to the Citizens Town Hall on Electra B2021. The conversation has since started, though, but the fourth set of panelists on the program have joined me here on the stage. Let's uh, make welcome a former INEC chairman, Professor Atai Rujega. Thank you so much, Prof, for coming on tonight. And we have Honorable Inena Ukeje, a former member of the House of Representatives. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you, Shane, for having me. And we have the Executive Governor of Nasarawa State, Governor Abdullah Sule. Thank you so much, Governor, for coming tonight. Thank you very much. We have the President of the Nigerian Bar Association, Mr. Ulumide Akwata. Thank you, President, for coming. Thank you, Shane. Thank you for having me. And the National Chairman of IPAC, Alaji Yabagi Sani. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me.
We have contributors for this very panel. Mr. Larry Arugundade, Executive Director, International Press Center. Mr. David Anyele, Executive Director, Center for Citizens with Disabilities. And Professor Remy Sonaya, former presidential candidate of COA Party. She will be joining us virtually. Let's get started. And I'd like to put Your Excellency on the hot seat uh, because um, uh, some people will blame you and your colleagues for putting us at this very point because they believe that it was the governors who opposed the bill majorly uh, because of the conversation or the controversies around the issue of direct or not direct primaries, which one of the things that the president vehemently says, it is undemocratic and returned it to the National Assembly. What was the reason why you and your colleagues are not at home with that particular clause? Thank you very much uh, for having me. And let me use the opportunity to clarify the point. It's like you said, you know, put to me on the hot seat. Because uh, when you invited me, I said, how many governors are you inviting? I said, only governor invited. I said, OK. And then here we go. I get the first uh, question. You know, the idea is a total misunderstanding that the governors are against direct violence. The governors are definitely not against direct violence. As a matter of fact, Going back to the year 2019, a lot of the states chose whether to do direct or indirect within the same political party. And a good example is, I will tell you, in the state of uh, uh, Niger, they actually conducted direct. And so many other states that we have under ABC conducted direct. So it's not that the state governors are against direct. What the state governors say when we had a meeting that I can remember, you know, the governors clearly said, all right, if they box us into a no option, I'm happy Mr. President actually mentioned exactly what we said. You know, what the governor said is that, why do we want to box ourselves, you know, into just an option? In case, God forbid, there is going to be another problem. There are so many states right now that even when you say direct or indirect, they can't, they can't, they can't have any Zamfara because of security situation we have right now, and so many other states, whether direct or indirect, because you see, direct is similar to what you would call general elections. So what we said was that, why don't you leave the options? And I'm happy a lot of the people who came out earlier mentioned that the electoral act has, is more than, you know, the bill is far more than just direct or indirect. There are so many important things there. Why are we boxing ourselves to either direct or indirect? So we say, in our own party, the APC, if you look at our own constitution, our constitution actually says three options. The very first option is consensus. If consensus is not possible, you know, you can do indirect. If that one is not, you can do direct. So we say give the political parties the opportunity. By the time the opportunities are given, you will be shocked. In the 2023 elections, a lot of the states will still do direct. So why are you saying the governors are against direct, governors are against indirect? It is totally false. The governors are just saying that provide an option. Don't box ourselves into saying only one option. In case something comes up that that option is not possible, are we going to go back to the constitution or are we going to have some constitutional issues? So that's it. That's the front page explanation. But the inside of the book explanation or the politics of the intrigues around it was that some of the lawmakers were uh, somewhat uh, looking at the situation where the governors usually be the ones to determine who get a ticket for the House of Assembly, the National Assembly seats, and they said that they wanted to work. This is the backroom conversation I'm giving to you, governor. Uh, and they said they wanted to work against that, that the governors are too autocratic in the politicking in their political parties and their state. And that's the reason why they wanted direct. They wanted the people to determine for themselves. You see, uh, Sean, sometimes once you have a meeting of the governors, before you even come out of the meeting, you will hear some headlines. And to be honest with you, most of the time, those headlines have nothing to do with the meetings that actually had taken place. But I think it's very unfortunate, especially the social. And social media has become factual these days. The moment anybody just throws out something in the social media, it is assumed that that is it. I live very close to Abuja. In fact, just three hours from life here, I get here. I didn't even know there was a bill passed until the governors call and say that we were going to have a meeting. And when we came to that meeting of the APC governors, the subject was brought. 
that that is the issue. What do we do? And I think the discussions were, why are they pushing us into, you know, just one option? Why are we not having options? You know, why are we not having things around and say this? We just finished our congresses in ABC. The very first one that we had, there were no ESCO, there were no delegates. So we did direct. We just finished that right now. You know, so who says any governor is afraid of direct or indirect? I think that is a very, very wrong, and that's one of the reasons why I said, well, it's an opportunity for us to come and explain. You know, there are a lot of governors today who will prefer direct. Once you take the elections to their state, they want direct. Because they strongly believe they are more popular, you know, with their people than even with their party. There are some state governors that are not in good terms with even the, 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 the party leaders in the state. And those kind of governors will prefer direct. So uh, tickets are not usually a witch hunt tools against uh, opponent within the party because we've seen this happen. No, I think, I think that's just an assumption. You know, uh, but, uh, a lot of people... Governor, I've had people, uh, I mean, I've had conversations around it. So yeah. it's no longer an assumption. It is the fact. The lawmakers had come on my program to say, this is the situation of things. And they want a situation where the governors are no longer the ones determining things all by themselves. Let me give you an example with Nasarawa State. Because Nasarawa made a statement in 2011. In 2011, a party called the CPC came in with Muhammad Buhari wanting to be president. When it came, Nasarawa State, we didn't even know anything called CPC. And Muhammad Buhari had never won election in Nasarawa State during the ANPP days. But because there was arm twisting of the governor, the governor was in good terms with the party. And so Tanku and Makura had no option going for, you know, an indirect that was going to happen. So Tanku and Makura opted with the people and now took over CPC and started trading. And the people told him, go ahead. And at the end of the day, Nasarawa State was the only CPC state in the entire federation. Not even Kasina State, the hometown of the president, voted CPC. We are the only CPC. Because the people decided that we want our governor, not uh, 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 the party, not delegates, no, nobody. And at the end of the day, you know, the people now decided with the governor against what happened in PDP. So I think the question, that's why I tell you sometimes, is just perception. An assumption that people believe that if the governor does this, this is that. If the governor does this, this is that. It's, it's just, you know, and, and most people are not actually politically involved. And as a result of that, they believe what they hear from the same politicians. You know, today, right. today in Nasarawa, I don't, I don't really hear whether direct, indirect, consensus, whichever one, let it come. All right. We're here. Uh, Honorable Ukeje, uh, <laughs> have you been a victim of this situation? I mean, I'm very sure that you've heard the conversation. Uh, this is not the only part of it, but it was uh, the problem that did not, one of the problems that didn't allow the bill to sail through. Have you ever been, be, ever been a victim of someone using ticket as a witch hunt? Um, well, um, Sean, those are very, very um, strong words, using ticket as a witch hunt. <laughs> but what I will say is that um, the conversations around this, um, this clause in the bill, a lot of my colleagues have actually said that what they were trying to do was give more power to more people as against the direct, um, the indirect primaries which uh, was proposed. Now for them, and a lot of my colleagues speak to the high attrition rate, every political cycle, you find out that there is a lot of, you know, there's a lot of conversations about the tickets and there's a lot of uh, people start to pander to the leadership of the political parties because their, politi their, their tickets are imperiled by the perceived um, hijacking of the political structure systems and institutions by the governors. So yes, um, there is that impression by a lot of people. But let me say that, um, again, I do not believe that the lack of choice in the political parties, within the political parties, would actually engender better um, elections or better um, selection processes. I was having a conversation with someone the other day, and I said to them that 
even if we were to have direct primaries, for instance, and people gathered together, this bill does not speak to one of the most important things, in my opinion, which is election violence. And if people came together and someone shot in the air, in, and it was a group of people, people were, were going to run away, and then the same institutions that we're worried about will still hijack it and throw up the person that they require. So for me, I believe that it is conjecture in some places, but to some extent it is also real, that people constantly have to pander to the structures, systems, and institutions of, of democracy in order to get the political parties. And sometimes the people who are the bearers of the tickets do not necessarily re reflect um, the choice of um, the popular choice. So yes, sometimes it is taken over, yes. Uh, I just wanted you to confirm to the governor that this exists. No, <laughs> I, I again... said that conversations like this exist. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Prof, uh, but you spearheaded more than two election circuits somehow uh, in, in this country. And if you look at things, we wonder where, how, whether or not we can go into the next election circle with the present law that we have. What do you think is the effect, the major effect of the delay in signing this bill? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, as, as you know. and, uh, uh, I, I think that this country will be better off if we go into the next election with a new electoral law uh, which would enhance the integrity of the preparations and conduct of elections. Um, the bill contains quite a lot of good things that can enhance the integrity of the electoral process. A good legal framework helps to have a good, a, a elections with integrity. And electoral integrities actually enhances democratic consolidation and the preparation and conduct of elections democratically. So, so really, since 2010, we have not had substantive improvements in the electoral legal framework until now. And clearly, the bill contains quite a lot of substantive improvements. So we must do everything possible to ensure that we go into the next election with a new bill. But I think what is most important also is that we must ensure that this bill becomes law as soon as is possible in order not to hamstrung INEX preparations for the conduct of the 2023 elections or even the uh, governorship elections that would precede the 2023 elections. So it's very, very important that really uh, we have a new legal framework for the preparations and conducts of the 2023 elections because it will improve the integrity of the preparations and conduct of elections. Now, on this issue of direct, indirect uh, uh, primaries, um, I think clearly the electoral process under normal circumstances would have better integrity if you do direct primaries appropriately. Because I think it's important to emphasize that because the discussions we've been having, people, it's very passionate discussion, people are taking position, and you are right. Members of the National Assembly perceive, and some of them know for a fact, that governors, maybe not in Nasarawa, but other governors manipulate the indirect primaries. And they think that if they move into direct primaries, they would be able to free themselves from that kind of manipulation. And they think that that will expand opportunities for citizens' participation. But we need to interrogate these things quite properly. You know, I, I would want to see a situation in Nigeria where we can have direct primaries and where we can do it well. As we speak now, Sheon, which of the major political parties has a clear register of members that they can use for direct primaries? Because if you are doing direct primaries, you need to have a register of people who have registered properly, who can come out, whom when INEC goes to 
monitor the elections, we know that the people who come out to vote are actually registered members of these political parties. You know, so we should be careful about trying to avoid or solve one problem and run into another problem. So to my mind, any governor that manipulates indirect primaries under the present conditions will also have the capacity to manipulate direct okay. primaries. Yeah. Hmm. Because the register of voters is not there and is key. To do direct primaries, you must ensure that every party has a register of voters that is credible, that citizens, organizations that are monitoring the elections can verify that the people who are coming out to vote are actually registered members of these parties. And the INEC itself, that has a legal responsibility to monitor, can ensure. So to my mind, really, uh, 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 until you do that, you will really just be moving without solving any problem. So my suggestion, what is key, what is a priority now, is give INEC the law to begin preparations for 2023 elections. And the only way to do it, the simplest way to do it, is not to override uh, 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 Mr. President, drop that issue of yeah. democratic prim uh, uh, direct primaries until you can ensure that parties really can actually do direct primaries when you want to do it. So that you can have a law that can be assented and quickly INEC will prepare for the 2023 general election. Let me tell you something that many Nigerians probably have not paid attention to. INEC made 36 specific recommendations to the National Assembly for the improvement of the legal framework, which would be better than the 2010 uh, Electoral uh, Act as amended. Out of this, the National Assembly adopted, without any correction, 25. And then it adopted five with some adjustments, so you can say partial adoption. So 31 out of the recommendations that INEC has made, which they believe was, will improve the credibility of the conduct of elections, they are actually now contained in this uh, uh, bill. But the challenge is what the National Assembly itself had introduced. They introduced things, I will argue, sometimes perhaps without uh, uh, real serious contemplation, thinking that it will solve a problem that some of them may have with some of the governors. <laughs> but it will not solve that problem. Mm. The challenge is how do you ensure that parties are properly organized, they have properly registered members, mm -hmm. and when it comes to election uh, of, of, of candidates for the parties to be fielded for elections, it, you use the proper register of voters. In fact, how do governors manipulate the uh, indirect primaries? It's through the uh, control of, of, the, of the delegate list. Because the delegate list is more or less like the register that you use for the indirect uh, uh, primaries. You know, so they will do the same thing and they will manipulate it. Mm. So what we need, we already have some fundamental elements that can improve the integrity of the elections. Mm. Let this be passed immediately. Rem drop this issue of direct primaries. Think more seriously about it. It is good. It should be done. But if we proceed to do it the way we are trying to do it now, we are likely to create more problems than we will solve. Alaji right. Yabagisani, uh, for the political parties in IPAC, were you surprised when the president refused assent? Not at all, because uh, what baffles us is the fact that the National Assembly did not engage in what all legislative bodies do, which is consultation, engagement with stakeholders before you pass a law. In this particular case, such an important bill was discussed, passed, without contacting the political parties to know how do we feel, how is it going to work. We are the ones to implement the law at the end of the day. So for somebody who is altruistic, you would have, you know, would have said, okay, let me ask even the managers, people who are going to implement this law you know, after we are passed. So you it. blame the National Assembly? No, I blame them, and I think it's just a dummy sold to Nigerians for, for their own selfish interest, if, if truth must be told. Otherwise, this is not the first time we are trying direct primaries. 
we know is a failure in all cases where it was, it was, uh, it was uh, tried. My party in particular, as we speak today, we are still in court because we tried in 2019 to introduce direct primaries in one of the states. Today, we are still in court, you know, with the litigation that came out, which you cannot put your hands around, you know, the issues themselves. So, as the National Assembly, I, I, these, are, these are people that are very familiar with these issues. So, for Mr. President to come out, I mean, and then this, again, is coming from the party that controls both the executive and the legislative, legislative arm of the government. So, why should we have this conversation? That's why some people are suspect are suspecting the, the, even the discussions itself that is it not a red herring that probably the National Assembly is up to something that they have not told us or the executive is up to something that they have not told us because if you remember Sean, the issue of direct transmission of uh, results you know, was, was like uh, something that you know Nigerians had to beg and then demonstrate in some cases that we need this direct uh, 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 transmission of, uh, of result electronically from the pooling, you know, uh, uh, points. So the point is this: Why do they bring in something that has no relevance to the, to the, to the whole discussions? So the irreducible really, minimum is that the national assembly must, because Nigerians say they want, you know, the bill to be passed into law. I'm talking about the electoral bill, which is which was sent to Mr. President. You know, minus the dummy that they put in it to, to give us, you know, some uh, some conversation we're having today. It has no meaning. It has no relevance. I, I, you can't. You can, I, mean, I mean, except well, idealistic. If you are if you are idealizing, you can say do direct primaries because you can say well, after all, democracy says you know government of the people by the people for the people. So it makes sense to say okay from the process engage the people. But how? Which country is doing direct primary today? Not even America, that you can say have tried this thing over 200 years, they are still having problems with uh, even the system. It's a delegate system. Go to every country that you can say, is it Asia, even African countries or Europe? Where is it practiced in the first instance? So why put us into these unnecessary discussions that have no meaning, no bearing with what we are talking about? What we are talking about is how do we improve the process of electioneering in this country? And again, another issue that I think we should also address, like Madan here says, is violence, which most, in most cases are, are, are introduced by, 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 by the people that, you know, have won. By the politicians. Uh, well, not, not politicians, by government, really. Because politicians are, do you have people who, who shoot in the air? Do we have the army? You know? No. But we so, hear so, that some of uh, you politicians are thugs. During in elections. Well, I mean, you because can't... where do the, the am, 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 ammunition come during well, the elections? Some politicians, and if you if you track, if you trace their, their origin, you find them in the politicians that I'm talking about. I won't mention any names here or any party here. But but the point and again another issue that I don't know why it's not you know being discussed in this bill in the law is the issue of the obscene use of money during elections, before elections, during elections, after elections. Why is that nobody has been tried in this country? You know, for and, and everybody in the world knows that we, we use money to the extent that you know you think the whole thing is about uh, 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 what you go to a Dumata market to buy. You have to carry money in in, in, uh, in Ghana must go cash and carry cash and carry cash and carry, and carry politics exactly politics. So I don't know why we did not you know in this bill address that issue how to you know ensure that the agencies you have EFCC you have CPC. I mean, ICPC, you have all sorts of uh, agencies. Why is it that no one person you know, has been taken in front of the court to say, you use money? And we know that the money is used obscenely to distort you know, the, the people's mandate. So, so I think for us... But I, I guess with electronic transmission of results, even when you have the money, uh, I think one of the agitation is that if these laws are passed, even when you have the money, the money will fail. No, it won't no, fail. No. This, this situation the money will still work? It yeah. will work. More than <laughs> much more than before, because it's like garbage in, garbage out. What we are saying, we are talking about electronic voting. We are talking about yes, electronic transmission, transmission of, of, of all the... Uh, all because the, the reason why I said so is that we saw election in Undo, we saw it in Edo, where, and, I mean, a lot of people will say that uh, there, were, there was a seemingly likeness of what happened at the polling unit and the outcome of the election. So uh, people are saying money is already failing some politicians. 
Oh, well, or, or, or you oppose that? Or, <laughs> I, the point I'm making is that what we are talking about is transmission of results. Yeah. The question is, you know, politicians, like you said, you know, very smart. You know, we find a way, you know, with time, how to, to, to even make it more uh, uh, completely, you know, out of tune with what people really did at the poll, at the, at the, uh, uh, the polling, polling, polling uh, yeah, votes. Me. Yes, you know, in terms of how people are, are circumvented by way of inducing them with money, you know. So, so, but I think if we have to be serious and we must be serious as a country because this country is too big you know to be toyed with in terms of all the things that we have as a people you know uh, somebody here mentioned that the other countries look up to us for leadership and and if we go on like this you know diverting attention from the real things and then giving us things that everybody knows has no meaning with what we're talking about i mean please you know we must be all right uh, let me bring we'll this. Yeah, let me bring in the president of uh, the NBA. This is basically about the law, and uh, the NBA, I would say, is not a conscience of the judiciary system in this country. Um, are you worried about how things have panned out since the president declined assent, and these conversations have gone on uh, uh, the, the legal window that we have left for us? What is your biggest concern? Should these not sell through? Thank you, Shimo. Am, am I worried? Uh, I'm petrified. I am. I'm, 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 I'm so disappointed the way things are, have panned out. Everything about that bill, or at least most of it, spells progress. Most of the provisions in the bill, to my mind, are pro-people, pro-the people. I see those provisions as incremental steps being taken to correct a process that has been adjudged by all to be efficient. We cannot, we cannot get it right all at once. You know, and so you can forgive people for things that our government is anti-people. You can forgive them if they come to that conclusion. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Leadership at the executive arm, leadership at the, uh, in the legislature. We have a bill that has, as we heard today, so many innovations that will advance the cause of this nation and her people including ensuring that INEC gets funding one year before the elections, including that people living with disability are included in the process, including that um, you must submit the names of your nominees 180 days. These are, all, these are all provisions that are responding to issues that have been highlighted in the process that are in need of fixing. And then has that bill on his table for quite a bit. And then last minute, almost last minute, because as we have heard today, we are running out of time. You can't foist a new law on a process and expect that process to work. There must be time. As uh, Professor Jagger has said, you can't, hamst you, can't hamst you can't allow for the process to be hamstrung by a new legislation or new piece of legislation. So Mr. President has pointed out this issue of uh, direct or indirect primaries and has decided that on the basis of that, he is sending it back to the National Assembly. I think, as uh, the speaker before me has mentioned, that we can be forgiven when we conclude that all of this is a smokescreen of some sort and that um, there is that what we have is a spanner being thrown in the works to keep us in, in, uh, in the doldrums so that we'll stay with the present uh, uh, dispensation because this is something that could easily have been fixed. Mr. President is of the same party as those who control the National Assembly. This is something that could have been fixed. I don't want to go into leg the legalese. This is something, if really our leaders are interested in progress for the people and for the nation, and are not 
uh, are not, uh, are not uh, fixated on uh, political uh, issues or issues that ha have to do with their own political fortunes. This issue should have been fixed. This bill, everything about it spells progress for the Nigerian state. Now, if, if there's a problem with direct and indirect primaries, I agree totally with Professor Jagger that we probably need to think carefully about implementing that uh, particular aspect uh, because we may not be ready. But I think this is some, these are housekeeping issues that could have been sorted out by those who are uh, in the, uh, at the helm of affairs in, in both arms of government. For us to get to this point where we're almost, uh, January of 2022 is almost over, and we're still talking about this, and should you ask me if I'm worried? My God, I'm, I'm, I'm so, so saddened by it because everything tells me that this is not going to work. Everything tells me that the booby trap that has been set is actually going to capture all of us and then we'll be back to square zero. And then we're going to go into another set of elections. And I think it was one of the speakers before us who said that we'll do the same thing expecting uh, different results. So, so we are in a bit of a pickle. We have, we have a problem before us and uh, our leaders need to really give this thing a rethink. There is a small window, a uh, small opportunity. I think the issue of direct and indirect primary, since the president has thrown a challenge in his interview with you, has, uh, has said to us that if that provision is removed, uh, the, he will sign, he will assent to the bill. I recommend to the members of the National Assembly, uh, let, us, let us take him at his word take out those, that provision, you, you understand? We can deal with that further down the road. Like I said, these are incremental steps. Take out those provisions. There's too much in that bill for the baby and the bath water to be thrown away. Hmm. I, I'd like to get some views uh, outside of his uh, circle, I mean, and the, uh, and the outer circle. I'd like to bring in Larry Arogundade, the Executive Director of International Press Center, just in about a minute or so, if you can, Wayne, con uh, bring in your contribution now. Uh, Mr. La Mr. Arogundade. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, I'm here. Well, I, I think uh, you started this conversation by talking about uh, the question of time. You know, time is central to the discourse that we're having. And in looking at this, uh, the, the blame uh, goes both ways. Uh, first is the fact that uh, it took quite a long time uh, for the president to get back to the National Assembly about his objections to aspects of this uh, important uh, bill. It took almost a month. We grant the right of the president to make consultations with different segments of the society, but that should also have been done with the understanding that we need to have this law so that we can at least uh, comply with frameworks that govern elections in our environment. Uh, you know, the ECOWAS protocol on elections, the African Charter on Democracy and Governance, all talk about the fact that anything about electoral law should be concluded a year to the elections. So I think that uh, the, the executive has part of the blame. But now that it has gone back uh, to the National Assembly, I do agree with everybody that uh, we need to do the needful. Otherwise, you know, it will just be like that, you know, old songs that says, uh, how many times shall the head turn for the eyes to see? Uh, how many times shall we pass bills for us to have uh, credible elections in this country? And now that we have an Electoral Act Amendment bill that in, in a substantial sense, captures the aspirations of the people at uh, the National Assembly should do the needful. But let me also uh, send this warning, Shion, that it's not only on the question of dropping the red primaries or not dropping it, that the president might not assent to this bill. And part of the concern from those of us from the civil society, uh, especially the EUSDGM partners, is that there are so many fundamental cross-referencing errors in the bill which in itself speaks volumes about the seriousness by which our legislators you know, take the issue of uh, lawmaking in this country. Uh, we all talk about the old question of uh, you know, how, well they are well, how well they are paid, the allowances, and the rest of them. 
And one would expect that at this stage, they should be able to pass a bill where you know, these errors will not constitute obstacle. Uh, Cynthia mentioned this in uh, the earlier part of the conversation that in 2018, August 2018, the president declined assent to that bill because of those errors. And we are worried that if those errors are not corrected, it might be a reason for the president not to assent to the bill. And some of them are quite important. Uh, there is a clause there, for example, if you look at uh, uh, you know, 14.2, that talks about election petition amendments. And in that particular bill, in that particular clause, they are relying on a non-existent provision talking about section 134 of the Electoral, of the Electoral Act Amendment Bill, which does not exist, whereas what they had in mind is section 285 of the Constitution. There is a clause where you just have mere repetition, clauses 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, we're essentially repeating the same things. So we have a precedent where the president didn't assent to an electoral bill because of those, you know, errors. Right. So the National Assembly, so when this bill goes by, so why we're now concerned about time is the fact that, well, consensus dropped the red primaries, but they also have to take care of all this, look at it very carefully, so that by the time it gets back to the president, uh, the needful uh, will be done. All there right. are many institutions in this country, shown outside the political organizations, that have oversight functions in elections. The media, my constituency, for example, Section 22 says we should monitor governance and hold government accountable to the people. We need to hold the political parties accountable to the electoral law. We need to hold INEC itself accountable. And if we do not have a credible law, it would actually undermine the capacity of the media All to right. set a proper agenda yeah. for our so, electoral process. Yeah. Thank you. Let me bring in uh, Professor Remy Sonaya. She's joining us virtually the former presidential candidate of Kowa Party. Let me take your uh, contribution, uh, Prof, quickly. Former presidential candidate of Kowa Party. Thank, thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. Yes. Um, th thank you. I am quite concerned about um, the deficit of trust that seems to be evident in some of the expressions that we have heard on this program this evening. We have heard words being used by you know, people um, on, on the platform who are really concerned. Words like red herring, like you know, booby trap, smoke screen, uh, spanner in the works. I think that we are at a, a very, very uh, critical moment in terms of... Oh dear, um, just as a moment when we are enjoying uh, our contribution. Uh, let me bring in uh, Mr. David Anyael, Executive in, Director, Center for Citizens with Disabilities. Uh, we, we seem to be having a problem with the connection. All right, I guess we... Okay, if we can hear... Uh, uh, Prof, please I, go ahead. I cannot hear you. Okay, go ahead. There was uh, some kind of distortion in your connection earlier. But we I can hear you ahead. now. Please go ahead. Oh, oh, okay, okay. What, what I uh, am trying to say is, is that we should probably look beyond the letter at this point and look at the spirit of the conduct of the elections themselves. The various uh, stakeholders, uh, it, it seems as if, you know, the people do, do not think that there is a real interest in improving the integrity of elections in Nigeria. And I think that I would like, you know, to uh, join in this call for asking that the direct primaries issue be removed. Okay, if that's the problem, let us remove it and let us see whether the president will go ahead and actually uh, assent to this uh, bill so that it becomes law. And let that be done quickly because as it has been repeated, there is a lot more to this bill than direct primaries. 
and it is we are doing ourselves a huge disservice if we uh, focus entirely on the direct primaries and forget all the other benefits like uh, the, the NBA pres uh, president has outlined them. Uh, so I would very much like us to think in terms of, of the spirit. Is there a real desire to ensure that we have credible elections All right. in Nigeria? But let me bring it in... It uh, seems yeah. as if, yeah, like I said, there's a deficit of trust. People are not really sure that uh, the executive and the legislature are really interested in doing this. So they have to prove that they are. All right. They have to prove. Th thank you so much, Prof. Um, uh, let me bring in Mr. David Anyaile, uh, the Executive Director, Center for Citizens with Disabilities, for his own contribution. It's supposed to be a minute to two minute contribution. Please, you can go ahead, Mr. Anyaile. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I've been, you know, paying key attention to the conversations, and one of the key issues that you know interests me in this new draft bill, or the bill, is the issue of overvoting. Uh, clause 51 provides that, you know, uh, where there is overvoting vis-à-vis -vis number of uh, uh, voters that were accredited, that you know that's what will be used to calculate the winner of such elections. If such uh, provisions is adhered to, what that means is that issues around trust, issues around acceptance, issues that leads to uh, 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 struggle for uh, winning or the winning of elections will clearly minimize. Ladies and gentlemen, if there is a time people with disabilities in Nigeria are clamoring for the passage of this bill, it is now. There isn't a simple, throughout the participation of the Federation, an average person with disability is committed not just to vote, but also to participate as a candidate. It is only when we have a credible, uh, generally accepted electoral framework that ensures that their confidence and trust in the electoral process is guaranteed that will trigger them to participate. Most of the things that we are all asking for, especially the marginalized populations, are all bordered around governance. About two years ago, 17th of January, 2019, President Bobo Bahari signed into an, into an act, the Discrimination Against Persons with Disability Provision Act. That act is in line with some of the provisions that the Lutheran Act has provided. Therefore, we are asking that Mr. President should do us a favor, as he did on the 17th of January, 2019, by signing this bill when the National Assembly returned it back to them. So as to guarantee Nigeria that Nigeria belongs to them, that their views count, that Nigeria, the future, is possible all right. for all of us. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much. Mr. Anyele. Uh, let me bring uh, the conversation back to the stage. Um, I know, uh, mm -hmm. Governor, I know you have an appointment just in a few minutes. Um, the, uh, you, you are very close to power. Uh, I'm talking about power at the center, meaning that your party uh, holds sway at the center. And a lot of conversation have gone around what your party that has the control uh, and the executive and in the legislature can do. It does look to me tonight that this is not a minority argument. It is a popularity. Uh, it has a popularity amongst the Nigerian population. And what do you think your party should be considering? This is a large clamor, loud clamor from Nigerians. Are you listening to it? Are you going to yield to it? Uh, of course, I'm listening to it, Ashewan, and that's why I'm here, and I'm happy that I, I came and listened to all these um, uh, highly respected individuals, you know, who had been participants, have been part of it. You know, it's different from where you are seeing it from outside than when you are right in it. Because, like, if you listen to Professor Jega, you know, he even mentioned to you why direct primaries will be impossible now. You know, he brought about the, the register. Even though our party, our professor, just finished our, our registration uh, exercise, with the exception of maybe two states or so, you know, which we have done. And then earlier on, you know, our party, when it was registered, we had like 100 people pay every uh, award, you know, that were registered. So anyway, that is, that is uh, uh, aside. 
But you see, and then I also listened to uh, our leader of IPAC, you know, where he mentioned challenging people to even go back and see which country is actually doing what we are trying to do, you know, just because some governors are untwisting uh, some people at, 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 at this. And I listened to everybody, including the NBA uh, president as well as my sister. You know, and it looks like everybody is saying, if the issue is just about direct or indirect, why are we getting ourselves there? And that was the only subject the governors had. You know, so I'm going back again to the governors, you know, what you mentioned. The governors are very happy with whatever contributions that have been made. A lot of contributions were made by INEC into this bill. A lot of contributions by, are made by several other organizations. I've seen Ralph Sanjani also here, you know, with the contributions that they have made. IPAC made, you know, and everybody. At the end of the day, those who collected those contributions and put it into a bill and sent it to the president remain politicians. You know, because sometimes people are saying that why politicians are anti-people? Well, it's the same politicians that put it together at the National Assembly and sent it to Mr. President and say, this is what the people want. And Mr. President, now from what I heard when you were actually interviewing him, he said, I have no problem whatsoever. Like uh, the president of uh, 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 NBA said, I have no president with all the good things that are in this particular bill. No problem whatsoever. They are for the people. They are this. The only one I have a problem with is this. And it looks, everybody is saying, if that is the only problem, set it aside. I think this time whole meeting is over. <laughs> not yet. Uh, I mean, because everybody is saying the same thing that the governor said from the beginning. Just <laughs> set it aside. And you, know, and, and, and you know why a lot of people are worried also? Yeah. It's because the president has promised also that he will leave a legacy of good election. That's one of the promises. You think he will keep to it? And this is one president that can do that. I have absolutely no doubt in it because you mentioned about I'm a governor and I'm close to that. I, I wouldn't tell you that I'm one of the closest people to Mr. President, but the time I have sat with this president, I have seen the genuine frankness in the way he talks and what he says. You know, I can't say Mr. President is perfect. I can't say Mr. President has everybody around him, the best of people. I can't say that. But as a person, and what he says, this is one person that he will tell you, this is what I want to do, and he will do it. This, I believe, right. about uh, Mr. President. So, I mean, you've been in the National Assembly. Yes. Uh, usually when we have this kind of thing, go back to the National Assembly. How easy? Because somewhat is a, is an ego issue. And we've seen this with the arms of government. So when the executive had returned this bill to the National Assembly, what kind of reaction do we, do, should we be expecting? Um, I think that um, the major job of members of the National Assembly is to collate the aggregate opinion of a critical mass of the Nigerian people. As we have sat down here, as Excellency has just said it, that you know, there's almost a unanimous clamor for this bill to be passed. This evening has highlighted so many other things that a lot of people probably were not aware of. So the National Assembly is duty bound to listen to the clamor of the Nigerian people. Our egos bruised probably, but I even listened to um, the Speaker of the House, um, Speaker Agbaja Amila, and he said, that um, at some commissioning some days ago, that if that was the only problem, that he was going to take you back to the National Assembly. Now, from the way he sounded, you can see that his back, I mean, he's not building walls around himself. But let me make the point that every National Assembly wants to leave a legacy. Every executive wants to leave a legacy. And I believe that straight out of the Democrats' um, book, playbook, is to leave a legacy, and if this is the one bill, polarizing bill, that has brought Nigerians together, clamoring for the one thing, and in their oversight is also a constitutional requirement that you oversight laws, appropriations, and policies. Now, if the National Assembly in its oversight has seen that there's certain lacuna in the previous electoral act that have made Nigerians suspicious of the electoral processes, that the National Assembly will, as a matter of urgency, do what it has to do, because already as it is, like I said earlier on, it is the job of the National Assembly to collate the aggregate opinion of a critical mass of the Nigerian people and do it. The National Assembly must project that which the Nigerian people want. In this room, we have everybody. We have civil societies. We have the NLC. We have the clergy. We have everybody saying the same thing. And all we're saying is that 
the Nigerian electoral processes have not delivered on the kind of elections that Nigerians want. Already as it is in Nigeria, and you know, we have seen that um, liberal democracy is imperiled around the world. We've seen it even in the United States that is the bastion of democracy. We have actually seen them hold um, a summit where they're having conversations about democracy. Nigeria as well plays that role in the sub-region. Every time there's a problem on an infraction in democracy, Nigeria is called to be front, right, and center in having those conversations and driving those conversations. So the National Assembly owes it. It is the, it is the right thing to do. It is the patriotic thing to do, and it helps Nigeria continue to maintain her position as a leader in the sub-region. Because if we don't do that which we must do, then can you imagine Nigeria selling to other countries the beauty of a democracy that we do not have? No. Therefore, I believe that the National Assembly will do what they must do, which is carry the voices of the Nigerian people in of the utmost importance and at the shortest possible time go through that, not only expunging that, but also looking at the inelegance in the drafting that makes it an embarrassing piece of legislation. I think that the National Assembly will do that in the shortest possible time. Um, well, we run, uh, run up this uh, session. I have one or two um, questions from the floor. Uh, it's a town hall meeting, so it's supposed to be uh, an all-encompassing conversation. Uh, Obina and Adara, please stand by. But uh, before we get them ready, uh, Prof, uh, you've uh, organized elections in Nigeria. How difficult is it for, from what you're seeing now, you're watching from the outside now, uh, the job of the man who succeeded you, how difficult do you think it is because of this old drama? Well, um, conducting elections in a country like Nigeria is certainly not an easy thing. Uh, it's a very difficult thing, but it's doable. And uh, I think both the chairman and the electoral commission and the other commissioners themselves can be helped a lot with a good legal framework because everything is supposed to be done in accordance with the law. And uh, as I have said earlier on, since 2010, we have not had substantive, remarkable improvements in the electoral legal framework. Now we seem to be on that trajectory. But again, we are wasting time. So you mentioned issue of ego. I, I think the National Assembly should not be thinking about ego. This is about the nation and improving the integrity of elections in our country. To my mind, when they resume, in a matter of maximum 10 days, they can address all these issues that have been mentioned now, whether the issue of cross-referencing and editing, as well as simply dropping the issue of uh, direct uh, 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 um, primaries. You know, we are not saying drop it because it is not good or because we do not accept that there are problems with the way in which indirect primaries are currently conducted. But we are saying that, look, you cannot throw the baby with the bathwater, you know. Don't go ahead and say out of ego, as you said, that we must have it, and therefore we are overriding Mr. President, because there are legitimate concerns and problems if you go ahead to implement it. Yeah. And also drop it. Let's think more carefully, prepare adequately uh, in future, but these good things that are already in this bill, should be signed into law immediately so that INEC can now begin to prepare guidelines and the issue uh, what needs to be done mm -hmm. so that they can start serious work with the 2023 general elections. All right. Mm -hmm. um, Your, Ex uh, Your Excellency, I, I would like to excuse you because I know that you made a commitment that you're going to be here, albeit you had uh, a prior engagement, but I must sincerely thank you for coming. Please, can we put our hands together for the Executive Governor of National State? Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, let me quickly uh, get the, um, the questioning from uh, Obina and uh, Adaura, and I'll get the reaction from uh, the stage here. Obina, uh, they're contributing from uh, the floor. Obina and Adaura, quickly, please. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Obino Sosiogu, um, Executive Director of Advocacy for Civic Engagement Center. Um, well, Nigerians do not trust the electoral process, um, and that is the fact. 
And this is backed up by evidence when you look at the trajectory of voter turnout since 2003. It's been on a steady decline. 2015, it was 43%. Um, 2019, it was 34%. And um, due to the work that we do at my organization, uh, we're in the streets. We interact with the people. We're trying to get them registered to vote. And they continue to express their distrust of the process. And one thing is clear. There's a general consensus among a lot of Nigerians that the electoral um, bill, you know, is, is, is timely. And it is clear to everybody that it will go a long way to show up the confidence of um, Nigerians. One of the common denominators in the conversation that we've had here today is that, one, um, direct and indirect primaries, it's, um, it's something that can be stepped down for the moment. Um, and then the second consensus that we have here, we seem to have here today, is the sense of urgency and the fact that all hands need to be on deck to ensure that this bill is passed. And my question will go um, to the distinguished speakers here today. Um, first of all, of course, to the MBA president because he represents my constituency as a lawyer. And of course, to the um, legislator as well here. What specific things can you um, commit to do based on the resources you have, the influence that you have um, as the head of the Nigerian Bar Association and um, the former legislator who, of course, has a relationship in the House of Representatives? What specific things can, or commitment can you make here today that um, you can do to you know, apply pressure on right. the House of Representatives right. to pass the electoral bill. Thank you, Obina. Let me, let's make the uh, interventions very quick and sharp. Uh, Adara Yokere, uh, please, uh, you have the floor. All right, my name is Adara Yokere. I'm a broadcast journalist and also the head for Women, Affairs and Gender for African Union Cluster Committee, Nigeria. Um, I, I once came across an article that said interrogating the Obanji Abiku spirit of the electoral amendment bill. And um, when I read it, it was very emphatic and very directly speaking to the issues. You're talking about a document that has five times been sent back to the sender. And now we're looking at the timeliness of this bill. I want to ask, amongst other things, um, this is very important to me because first, as a Nigerian woman, I'm also looking at the cost of election, money politics in election, which is what section 88 of the bill also looked at. And in the new version of the spending limit proposed in the section, it now seems to say that candidates seeking presidential election are allowed to increase their cash hole from 1 billion to 15 billion. Those who are looking at governorship are allowed to increase it from 1 billion to 5 billion. Senate 1.5 billion from 40 million. House of Rep now can take that from 30 million to 500 million and state assembly from 10 million to 50 million. Now, if we're looking at inclusion of young people in election, and the voices of women's participation. How critical is it to also look at ending money politics in this conversation? And I put this because I know that Honorable Nenu Keje is sitting down there and she also represents the voice of women. Is it important to also look at this as a problem and begin to also take that detail and take it back to the National Assembly? Thank you. Thank you so much, Adara. Thank you for those interventions. And uh, I think it's a, it's a good point for us. Let me allow Alagi Abadi Sani. Uh, to intervene. Uh, money politics and uh, of course I'll allow uh, the NBA president and Honorable Kege to respond to those interventions also. Uh, thank you, Shem. I think about one thing here. Uh, I, I wouldn't like ourselves to play to the uh, suspected you know, scheme whether it's true or not by you know, trying to take a fine comb through the whole thing and say this, uh, you know, must dot this I and cross this T and all these things, you know. And then again, we get ourselves bogged down with such details. I think, you know, the act of legislation, like uh, we all know, is, is not a destination. It's, it's a journey. You know, we can, I, I remember the PIA bill, that is the Petroleum Industry Act, was passed with, with some, uh, you know, uh, some uh, uh, areas that are not really, you know, engaged, you know, the way it should be. But in spite of that, the bill was passed. And today, you have agencies that have been created based on the, on the passage of that bill, and amendments immediately, I think within the, the 24 hours or so, you know, the executive again was preparing an amendment, you know, to those bills. So I would like us to be careful not to, you know, uh, 
get ourselves into another problem where the National Assembly will say, oh, uh, because we have to do this, we have to do that, you know, we are highlighting the things, so we must be careful not to get ourselves entangled in some of these fine details that we are talking about. I'm not saying it's not they are not important, but as a nation, you know, we can go on. I mean, it's not as bad as where we are coming from. Anyway, what do we have today? You know, and, uh, and uh, so that's one thing, you know, caution I want to, uh, you know, sound, a word of caution. Then money politics, like I said earlier, you know, is something that we must address and address it in a manner that will allow, you know, the mass, the critical mass of Nigerians, especially the youth, to get involved in, 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 in party politics. We, the, the political parties, we, we are preaching to the Nigerians that we want youth, we want women, women to come in then if we now say that you must have this amount of money, you know, before you come in, uh, I, I don't think that's what the bill says. The bill says that you can spend as much as that amount of money. You know, it doesn't say that you must pay, you know, one, I mean, uh, how much billions. We're talking about the, the, the limit. Is yes, it not limit. obscene to have that kind of money? It is, but what I, the point I'm making is that we shouldn't box ourselves into a situation where we now play to the hands of uh, those like some if of we are people today. who do not really have the money, yes, and we are we are given a spending limit, yes, it's like you don't have money, and you are giving yourself a terrible, an, an obscene, a budget or limit spending limit. Is, is it not? Is it right? Is it morally right? It's not. That's right. a question. The, the point I'm making is that it doesn't say you must have that money before you can participate.